Concussions are always at the front of mind when it comes to sports and in the athletic training profession, and in none more so than recently, given how things have played out with some high-profile NFL injuries, particularly Tua Tonga Viola with the quarterback for the Miami Dolphins. Lots of things on social media uh, going back and forth, lots of discussion about how things went, how they didn't, what actually occurred, what does what mean, comments from the coach, just a whole lot of things going on. So we wanted to follow up and do an episode with Dr. Julie Stam, who is a neuroscientist, has done a ton of work in the concussion world, uh, both in her doctoral work at uh, Boston University, but then also just continuing on and with her book, The Brain on Youth Sports. So we talk about just a lot of the overarching things that happened with this, a little bit about the specific incident, um, but also just what potentially could be done to help improve this situation and other things that we should look out for for everybody else that potentially suffers from a concussion. As always, we are powered by Mueller Sports Medicine. They keep coming out with new innovative products check out revive their pneumatic compression we'll have more information coming on that and also check out um, i believe their new ankle uh, brace is coming out soon which could be a game changer for people that are looking for a different option when it comes to ankle support but without further ado please enjoy this episode Welcome to this episode of Athletic Training Chat. We are on with repeat guest, uh, Dr. Julie Stam, who was on, I'll get the episode linked up, um, talking about her book, which if you're watching this on video is in the background there, The Brain on Youth Sports. And we were just talking about concussion and injury to youth and how that, but obviously recently with some of the high um, profile injuries that have occurred in the NFL, um, the commentary on how that was managed um, or not, depending on your <laughs> look at that. And then a few other ones, I've seen some other clips come up where there's potentially some uh, detrimental things that uh, were potentially missed as well. We wanted to talk to her about just kind of everything that was going into it and go over some of the fencing response, second impact syndrome, the ability to consent, and then a few ideas for improvement. So uh, before we jump into that, Julie, if you wouldn't mind giving just a little bit of your background again, just so everybody kind of knows where you're coming from and why we're talking about this with you and your background. Yeah, so I uh, am a licensed athletic trainer. I did my undergraduate work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in athletic training. I spent years as a graduate assistant athletic trainer at Boston University. Uh, and then I began my doctorate at Boston University. Uh, and the School of Medicine there. And my research was at the uh, CTE Center studying chronic traumatic encephalopathy, concussions, and the, the consequences, especially long-term consequences of repetitive brain trauma and concussions. So not just the concussions, but also just those repetitive impacts sustained uh, in sport. And since then, I've continued to uh, study those topics, study concussions. Uh, and I wrote a book, as he's mentioned, The Brain on Youth Sports. My um, you know, one big area of interest is repetitive brain trauma in youth sports um, and concussions in youth sports, um, as well as concussion management uh, and kind of everything around uh, that. Awesome. First, I just want to start with uh, the fencing response. We were talking off air, you know, it is not something that is common, you know, even with concussion, it, it doesn't occur I don't know any percentages if there is even some out there on the occurrence I've dealt with it at least twice in my career one where somebody just snapped right out of it and the other not so much uh, one he fully fenced but also was snoring uh, when I got out to him which was um, interesting but if I was wondering if you could just define what the fencing response is and just kind of talk about that in general just so we can kind of set a baseline for the conversation yeah, so um, 
I think people who saw the the play with Tua, um, the way that the arms are positioned and the way his fingers are positioned and that kind of stiffening of those upper extremities. Um, and this is something we're really concerned about because it indicates, uh, and I don't, I don't like to use the word more severe, the term more severe injury, um, but it really is an indication of potentially a more severe injury, uh, also potentially involving the brainstem. Uh, and that's something that's really concerning because the brainstem is just critical to life, right? We have so many um, centers in the brainstem for things that are just essential to being alive. Uh, and so we're really concerned anytime that the brain stem may be involved. Um, and it can indicate that, it can indicate more uh, severe injury and swelling within the brain that could be affecting the brain stem as well. So that's why that type of posturing, as soon as you see that, it's something that just jumps out right away that, you know, we're always concerned about a concussion and concussions may not look that bad and have life um, altering consequences, you know, with just prolonged symptoms, things like that. But when we see that response, it's something that jumps out as being extra concerning right away. That was something, again, we were talking about off air, you know, to my knowledge, and you would know this better, there's there is no diagnostic formally, you know, objective for a concussion. There's, you know, no scan or anything like that. There's a lot of areas people are looking at um, biomarkers and everything um, for concussion specifically. but talking about the brainstem, you know, and potentially because of that fencing response from your experience, and we can chat about mine as well. What have you seen for just like helping try and clear that as another aspect of this trauma that somebody faces? Do you mean as far as return to play? Yeah. Or just, you know, making sure, you know, for quality of life that they're going <laughs> to, things are going to go, you know, go well. Um, and that hopefully everything's still functioning. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, initially, like, this is something where if I see fencing response, um, I'm thinking as, you know, a clinician on the field, like, this is an immediate referral, right? A concussion may not be an immediate referral. Um, it's something that, as athletic trainers, we manage frequently. Um, but when you see that kind of extra step, that's a, a referral uh, for me right away. Um, they're more like we going to have imaging done to ensure that there isn't any um, visible damage. Again, just because we don't see it doesn't mean it's not there, right? Uh, and we really want to be conservative with this return also, if there's a return, right? I think that's uh, a place where a conversation has to be made. And, and you know, as you know, every concussion is different and every scenario is different. So it's hard to say, like, you have this response once and you shouldn't go back, or you have it twice, you shouldn't go back, maybe twice is a maybe you shouldn't go back, but, um, you know, it, it's really consulting with your, uh, your medical team, your athletic trainer, doctor. And, you know, we just want to be really conservative on this case because it is such a critical area of the brain that, you know, we're going to want to make sure that there is nothing ongoing in that spot. Um, we do know that the brainstem is actually involved in a a lot of uh, concussions and repetitive brain trauma. There have been studies that have shown uh, the the midbrain is the top or superior most uh, part of the brain stem. There have been studies that have shown uh, changes in the that area and the white matter in the brain stem, uh, even just with repetitive impacts. So we know that that's an area that's involved. And when we reach the point where we start to see symptoms, we know this is pretty severe. So we really want to be sure to take that very seriously and just be conservative because your life is far more important than the next game and your quality of life like you said is far more important right just to kind of make sure we're putting it out there like injury to the brain stem that goes severe where you're seeing symptoms we're talking what type of changes in ability to live you know beyond paralysis which obviously is its own um, you, big one in itself. What other things are we talking about could be impacted and why it's so important to ensure there's no injury to the brain stem and also be very cautious about return in case there were another injury? Yeah, the brain stem has a lot of uh, different functions it's involved in. 
Um, we could see persistent motor deficits because uh, it has several centers that are involved in controlling uh, our motor activity. So not only, um, you know, just the ability to move like paralysis, but we have other centers that help us control our movement. So you may see uh, other deficits with posture. Uh, Parkinson's-like symptoms okay. are, are symptoms that you might see with damage to some of these areas in the brainstem. But it also houses areas that are involved in controlling our heart rate, our respiratory rate. That's why we say it's so uh, concerning as far as like ability to sustain life because heart rate, respiratory rate is controlled there. Um, and you know, those, those kind of unconscious things that sustain life, consciousness, awareness, uh, has, you know, those types of, um, just being aware and, you know, arousal, uh, in our daily life. Like there are centers there that are involved in those processes. So, uh, it is a really critical area. Perfect. Thanks for just kind of summing that up. So everybody is kind of back on the same page there. Moving away from the fencing response, uh, second impact syndrome, something we're all taught about. Everybody is generally aware of the concern of that. You were recently interviewed by a national news outlet kind of talking about it. And I think one of the lines from it was, you know, a second concussion doesn't always mean second impact syndrome. Um, if you could just kind of talk more about a, just redefining second impact syndrome and what that means, and then just any more of the nuance, because there's always nuance with it, that kind of comes with it as you were kind of explaining in that interview. Yeah, you know, I think this is such an important thing that came up from this particular injury with Tua and that a lot of people were talking about second impact syndrome and there are multiple potential bad outcomes from a second impact before we have healed from an, the first concussion. Second impact syndrome is just one of those potential outcomes. And it's actually not super common. Um, I don't have an exact percentage, but it's not a, a super common thing. Uh, it's relatively rare, but when it happens, it's about 50% um, mortality rate, which is why we're so concerned. And then, you know, if you live, like there can be devastating consequences um, still. Uh, so what happens is we have this second impact that happens after a concussion and it may be that someone doesn't come out of the game or it may be that they return to play too soon before the brain has really recovered from the first one and that second impact which you know often cases doesn't have to be something that looks scary right it can be just a routine tackle that can cause this uh, but it causes this dysregulation of blood flow in the brain that leads to this rapid swelling in the brain and that you know, of course, puts pressure on the brain, puts pressure on the brain stem, and it can look somewhat similar presentation wise to something like an epidural hematoma that is also rapid swelling in the brain or because of the, the brain bleed, um, where you have this kind of lucid period where they seem okay and then they just, you know, go unconscious and um, rapidly decline. It's not the same as a, an epidural hematoma, but it can present in that similar way. Sure. And as I said, it is about 50% uh, mortality rate from what we know with these cases. It can lead to you know, paralysis and just debil debilitating lasting symptoms. So um, it's a catastrophic injury no matter what. So this is why we take it so seriously. And I think an important thing in this case to point out too is that Tua is older. And while it's still something that is a concern, he would be one of the older cases ever reported of this if it would to, were to have happened to him, which it did not. Uh, but it's far more common in younger players. So uh, your youth high school players and possibly college players too, but especially youth in high school, that's where it's been seen the most. Uh, we don't necessarily know exactly why it's likely a developmental related, uh, you know, process that's making it more common there. But I think this case with Tua has brought this to the forefront. And we really need to say like, this is something that's even more of a concern for younger players uh, that, you know, parents should be aware of, coaches should be aware of, players should be aware of. Mm -hmm. This is why we really need to take this seriously and just give the brain time to recover. 
kind of going back to our diagnostic conversation again, you know, we're very clear. There's no true objective measure of concussion in terms of putting someone in for a scan. Um, you kind of referenced how it can present like an epidural hematoma. And obviously if it gets to that point where something, you know, they dramatically drastically change in the presentation, there's going to be a lot of imaging, you know, to do that. Is there something, you know, potentially in this case, you know, imaging wise that they could go to just rule out to see if there was bleeding occurring that maybe they could be concerned or catch it in quotes, catch it early, you know, if they're because of the repeat or anything like that, it, that you've come across in your literature reviews and, you know, everything that you know. Yeah, not really, you know, okay. with the concussion, it's not something that we typically can see anything on imaging. So right. we do have research-based imaging that I think shows a lot of promise for concussion, but it's not something that we understand well enough uh, to have it be clinically useful yet. Uh, and that's something I think we will have in the future. We're just not there. Gotcha. Uh, but right now we can't see anything to diagnose a concussion. And so it's really hard to know when, you know, we're really truly ready to go back to play. Um, and, you know, if someone goes back to play too early, which can very easily happen because a lot of this is based on player symptom report. So mm -hmm. if they're saying, oh, I'm fine, even if they're not, you know, it can be hard. We don't have a great objective test. So they end up going back early. And, you know, then once this event happens, it's such a rapid decline, okay. like I'm talking seconds to minutes that they're going to the ER, they're gonna get right into the scanner to see what exactly is causing this. And it will look different, you know, in the scan of a focal area of bleed versus just kind of a global swelling. Sure. Um, and then from there, it's just management based on that, which may be, you know, efforts to reduce swelling on the brain, um, you know, removing a piece of the skull, that kind of thing. It can be yep. very drastic to try to, to save that individual. Appreciate your insight there. Um, anything else around second impact syndrome that I haven't really asked or that you would want to touch on? You know, obviously we talked about the severity, which I think is generally known, not overly common, but something to be concerned about. Anything else? I think, you know, maybe, I'm sorry if you're going to go into this, but no. um, I think just really understanding though that even though second impact syndrome itself is not that common, the consequences of sustaining a second concussion too soon after the brain had healed or before the brain had healed, excuse me, uh, it still has consequences. The far more common consequences, which are really common if you have that second concussion too soon, uh, is that, you know, the concussion symptoms are going to be more severe. They will tend to take much longer to recover, have more prolonged recovery. Um, and that can be even months to more than a year. Uh, though the risk of that really long recovery is higher when you have the, these two injuries so close together. Uh, and it can be really life altering, right? Like, you know, you can have difficulty if you're younger in school in you know, your social relationships, like just like any concussion can cause that, that risk is just higher because those symptoms tend to be more severe. Uh, I think that is something that really needs to be pointed out that even though it may not be life threatening, it is, it definitely can have a huge impact on your life and it can have a, a huge impact for a much longer span of time if those injuries sustain, are sustained closer together. And, you know, we we're learning a lot about the long-term consequences, but you know, it's definitely not good for the brain. Sure. So I think we have more to learn about, um, you know, what kind of long-term consequences specifically come from multiple concussions close together. Uh, but it's, I don't think it can be good in the long term uh, either. Well, general intuitively makes sense when it comes to that. Absolutely. Well, kind of the last topic that we were wanting to talk about, um, you had a tweet or a thread um, that caught some attention, rightfully so. And you were talking about the ability to consent and to return to play and there's so much that goes into that and we'll try and kind of tease out some of that. But if you wanted to, if you could just kind of summarize what you were trying to get across, you know, in that thread, and then we'll kind of dive off from there. Yeah. You know, it, I think we have to think about our patients, you know, our athletes as 
you know, kind of a whole and, and a person as we're making these decisions. And we have to think about that with respect to consent as well in that, you know, Tua, for example, if you have a concussion, you may not be capable of truly understanding what's happening in the moment. And every concussion is different. Maybe your symptom is a headache and cognitively you're doing you know, relatively well. Maybe your you know, symptoms are more motor-based. Like every concussion is a little bit different. But that's something at least that has to be taken into account is are you actually cognitively aware enough to make this decision to return yourself to play or say that you're okay? Uh, and in some cases, the answer is definitely going to be no, right? Um, but we also have to think about all the other things weighing into it, right? Every, every athlete wants to play. Like, that's just the nature of being an athlete. We're competitive people. Like, we, an athlete wants to play. And they want to help the team. And that's at every level. But when you get to the professional level, too, like, he has a history of injury, which is you know, not necessarily a good thing when you're being paid to play and people may not want to invest in you if they're concerned that you're going to be injured again. He's making a lot of money. They're having a successful season for the first time in a little while. And, you know, that I think all of those things play into, of course, he's going to want to go back in regardless of whether he should or not. So to give him this choice, you know, he is not going to ask, act in his best interest, most likely. Most players won't. So, um, you know, I think also with the, he's at the professional level where there's all these other factors playing in, when you look at kids, for example, like can an, an eight-year-old understand the long-term potential impacts or even the short-term impacts of returning to play with a concussion, what it can do to them and their lives and their school and their friendships and all of that? Probably not. <laughs> you know, right. there's a reason we don't let eight-year-olds or 10-year-olds or 12-year-olds make decisions about big life things. You know, that's what parents are for. So, um, you know, in part, right, parents are making those decisions. So I think, you know, at every level, you have to weigh that, you know, is, is this athlete really capable of making this decision for the long-term and understanding long-term? As we get to be an adult, you know, that question does come up a little bit more, but I, as a clinician, would never put somebody back into a position or allow themselves them to make a decision to put themselves back into a position where we know there's high risk. Like mm -hmm. I think somebody had said something, well, people make decisions to drive and do activities of daily living. Well, those are activities of daily living, right? And with driving, we actually know concussions actually do, there's some evidence uh, that they do impair driving. Sure. So you know, something that I think we'll, we'll find more out about in the coming years and what is really safe or not. Uh, but you know, there's a, a difference between doing that and doing an activity where you're knowingly putting them out into harm's way. I think if we were looking at, um, you know, a different job type setting, there's a, a great researcher, Adam Finkel, uh, who looks at like football and NFL kind of related to OSHA type standards. Sure. And if you looked at, uh, you know, football as uh, you know, a, a job and you took somebody else who was in a job where they sustained an injury, are they, you know, in a factory setting or, a, you know, other settings, are they going to put that individual back into that specific role where their injury is high while they're still recovering? They'd be at high liability for that, right? Like that would be a high liability situation. Right. So, you know, it, it's really about what they're going back into which clearly football would be a high risk scenario. No, that makes sense. And when you frame it that way, that's kind of, it's very, you know, a unique take on it, which, which there should be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, you think about the NFL as a job and to say somebody like should be able to consent to go back to their job. It's different. <laughs> you know, it's not, this isn't office work, which even then if somebody had a concussion, we would say, limit your activity like do the things that don't exacerbate symptoms but you know there's not a risk of having repetitive impacts in your Absolutely. office right if you're in a job setting where it's uh, a higher risk setting like oftentimes they'll find alternative work for you to do while you're healing right uh, but there really isn't alternative work in football like your job right. is healed and you're going to take these impacts so uh, it's 
you know, I think different to say, put some, like, let somebody make that decision themselves when there's so many factors weighing on them. And, you know, what very few athletes would think in their best interests and act in their best interests. They would just say, let's go. You were talking about the pressure on that and you shared a, uh, NATA journal, um, article about the pressure on sports medicine clinicians to prematurely return collegiate athletes to play after concussion. Um, sorry, I was just pulling that up so I could make sure I got that right. If you could kind of summarize what was found there, because not every athletic trainer, thankfully, deals with that, but there is still is in the secondary setting, I have to imagine. I, I haven't worked in it, but I got to imagine coaches still push. Even parents might still push just, you know, chance at winning the game, my scholarship, things like that. Uh, definitely can see it in the collegiate level, especially at the higher power five division one, you know, because as much as it's not quote unquote a business, it, it is becoming more and more um, for in a lot of different ways. But if you could kind of summarize that and talk about things that you've seen or experienced, um, that'd be great. Yeah. So this kind of came off of the, uh, idea that was being talked about that to have been cleared by an independent neurologist. And I think we need to really understand like this idea of independence and um, the pressures that are still involved. <laughs> and uh, the study that we did uh, was led by Christine Bond, Emily Crocious, uh, and um, we brought on Mark Larson from Boston University as well, because Boston University has a unique setup where their athletic training department is under a medical model. So they are not part of the athletic department. They are a separate medical group providing care, meaning that they don't have this direct report line to the athletic department. Uh, most, the vast majority of universities and colleges do have that set up where the sports medicine department is under the athletic department. And that creates concern about, oh, well, if I act in the best interest of my athletes and the coaches don't like it, is my job going to be at risk? And that's the same thing at the professional level, right? They're paying your paycheck. If you act in the best interest of your athlete and the coach doesn't like it, you know, they may say this person is too conservative or they don't know what they're doing and you might get fired for that. Right. So that is a real concern uh, when it comes to those pressures about return to play. And it's a concern with a lot of injuries, but uh, concussion is a big one for that. So we surveyed um, clinicians both uh, team doctors and athletic trainers at uh, colleges all over and universities all over the country. And uh, basically, not surprisingly, what we found was that uh, there were greater pressures to prematurely return athletes to play after a concussion for those who were in a sports medicine department that were under an athletic department than there were pressures when they were under a medical department. So when your boss was essentially an athletic director, you felt more compelled or more pressure at least to return athletes to play early. That pressure came from coaches, from players. Uh, and it, you know, it seems kind of obvious, but there hadn't really been numbers <laughs> put to it before. Sure. Uh, but we don't also know if they had actually acted on that. We didn't survey if they, you know, maybe they felt the pressure, but they stood their ground. Uh, versus they felt their pressure and they think they might have put somebody back early. We didn't ask that question. So that's gotcha. still to be studied. Uh, but I think that is just one example. You know, this hasn't been studied at the professional level. And a lot of this isn't going to be because in many ways, what the NFL and other professional leagues don't know isn't going to hurt them. Right. So, um, you know, they're not going to do those kind of surveys. But we part of the reason that the independent neurologist was, you know, became part of this whole conversation was because of this concern of pressure. You know, the team's going to say, well, we want to return this athlete. Uh, but to think that they're just independent isn't really true. It, right. You know, there, it, and I want to say, like, there are great clinicians out there, athletic trainers, team doctors at all of these levels in the pros and the college that will act in the be best interest of their athlete, no matter what. So, you know, there are many um, out there who, despite these pressures, do a great job. 
but it is really hard when even as an independent neurologist, you're still paid by the league yeah. and you have many benefits that come with that, right? You can say, oh, I'm an independent neurologist for the you know, NFL, come to my clinic because you're getting more patients that way. You may get more professional opportunities from that um, you know, with, in a variety of ways outside of the NFL. So there, there are benefits to that, uh, even if you are independent and there is still a risk of coaches complaining and the league saying, ah, I think we're going to go with someone else. So, um, you know, some people may be influenced by that. And it's just something that we have to keep in mind. I thought it was interesting. I didn't realize this, uh, especially after this, in this latest one with the Tua situation had been fired that both the players association and the league had the ability to fire any of these neurologists without agreement from the other side, which I, I can understand where that comes in as a stopgap of, you know, trying to have both sides in, in theory, the players association is for the betterment of the players. That's why they collectively bargain against the NFL and it, it goes hand in hand, but that I can see how that could put some of these neurologists in a really strange spot on any given, you know, situation, depending on the player and, you know, at points in their career and their, you know, I've only got X amount of years left. I need to collect every paycheck that I hand because if I'm injured, I'm not getting paid depending on contracts and different things. So I thought that was interesting and there's seemingly no awesome solution <laughs> um to the yeah. problem but i i could see where for some of these people it is just a really a rock and a hard place it's really true and i actually didn't realize that both had that ability to fire as well and i think that it needs to also be understood that the the players association in theory is out there just protecting the players but they're protecting the players on all aspects they want them to be safe injury wise yep but they also want to protect them as workers right yep. as people who are getting a paycheck and so they also may not like someone who is who they feel is too conservative who's diagnosing too many concussions or saying oh well we'll do, we're going to hold you out just in case because they don't want players to be labeled with a concussion that could append, you know eventually affect their career if they're you know it, which we should just be conservative right that's the right thing to do but there's so much money on the line and all that, that, you know, the players association and the players also don't necessarily always want that diagnosis either just in, you know, just the, just in case diagnosis. So and that's the hard part, especially with that league, because yeah. most of their contracts, there's a lot of non-guaranteed money that's mm -hmm. changing more so now, because I think the players are demanding it more, but th there's so many incentives built into these contracts that you know they sign these huge deals but then they always come back with it's still a lot of money don't get me wrong you know only x amount is actually guaranteed and the rest is you know if you're hitting these things so like to your point you know if you get hurt early on in the season and it, it, they keep pulling you you know you're being held out for a concussion for multiple weeks your ability to earn probably just dropped by a significant percentage because you're not going to be able to hit those metrics that were put into your contract. Yeah, absolutely. That's such an important point. Um, and I think, you know, I just to kind of add this in, I've heard a lot of discussion and, and I have brought this up too. I don't think I made it in the article that um, it, just about the, the mandatory stand down periods. So in uh, Europe and in Australia, uh, in major league rugby or you know, rug, um, the professional rugby leagues mm -hmm. there, and even um, in soccer, which I did, didn't realize or, um, until recently, uh, there are mandatory stand down periods and it depends on the league, but um, it might be that you are, if you are diagnosed with a concussion, you are out for anywhere from like 10 to 21 days, even in some leagues. Okay. So those professional leagues, which are, you know, professional rugby in Australia and Europe, like that's on the same level as, as NFL here, right? It's a big deal. Uh, and these are, you know, it's the closest sport comparison to sure. as far as just how the game is played and they are implementing that. But you do have to wonder though, if that did eventually become a thing in the NFL, would that be even less incentive to report? Would right. we only be capturing 
the really bad ones, like the ones that present right away is really bad anyway. You know, not that they Absolutely. aren't bad yeah. if you can hide symptoms because, you know, that's still a thing. Um, and I think, you know, the best thing, really medically, the best thing would be to have that mandatory time where, no, you are out this long because your brain, we know that even if you don't have symptoms, the metabolic cascade and chemical cascade that happens takes, you know, to at least 10 to 14 days, if not more to heal. So this is a stand down time. But because of all of those incentives that you were talking about, like if they know they're going to be out for a set amount of time, sometimes just the hope of maybe I can get back sooner might make somebody more willing to report than saying, nope, you're out this long. Right. So it's just, it's such a difficult thing. You know, it's hard to find what's the right balance that will lead to the best outcomes for the players. Well, that kind of brings us sort of to the wrap up. We obviously can go into further things, but to put you a little bit on the spot, if you had the almighty, you know, could wave a magic wand, you know, to try and make this better. You know, you mentioned the mandatory stand down periods, things like that. What what would you see as ways that could potentially be improved, fully knowing that they may not get implemented at any time in the near future? But just from your experience and what you know from the research, what seemingly would be the best approach if you had the perfect world to do it? I think, you know, my definitely my perfect world would be we'd have an easy sideline or easily implemented, you know, athletic training room biomarker. And I think we are on the way there. There's a lot of promise that I've seen with saliva biomarkers. Okay. Um, and, you know, there are some with blood biomarkers that that gets a little bit more invasive. I'm not sure that those are at a pinprick kind of level yet. Sure. Um, but there is promise. So it's going to be quite a while with um, saliva biomarkers. There, There is some evidence with like EEG type caps, um, yep. like brain scope, if you've heard of that. Um, it's just not quite there yet to my knowledge. Um, but something like that, where we could definitively say, like, you showed some signs or that was a nasty hit, let's let's take a look, uh, would be one piece. Even without that, though, I do think the stand down time, the sit out time is really important. I don't think anybody should be cleared the next week, you know, to come back to a football game after a concussion. Um, it's just not worth it, right? <laughs> like, um, for the health wise. Again, at the higher levels, there's a lot of money involved, but I do think that would be my perfect world. But that combined with just a general acceptance of athlete health is the most important thing. So understanding like, yes, all the coaches, all the athletes, all the administrators, you know, everybody involved saying, yes, this is the right thing. You're going to sit out. You'll get your spot back when you come back. Uh, you know, that would be the the perfect world scenario, but you know, that's, like you said, we don't live in a perfect world. So yeah, there's still steps to take, and it seems like some of them are being taken slowly. It's just, can we really get them to hit fully? Because you kind of just even going back to your the uh, article you guys did. You know, the NCAA has put you know athletic trainers have unchallengeable authority when it comes to safety and health, safety and well being. But that that becomes tough that yes it's there but how is it enforced is it enforced who is going and making those enforce enforcements assuming that they actually get reported and you know just coming up and that you get a lot of young ats that are taking some of these positions with coaches that have been there that have been coaching longer than the ats been alive like that is a really tough dynamic to be a part of and feel empowered to do those things. And it, I'm sure at the secondary setting too, again, not having not worked in it, you know, until you get a little later in your career and maybe not even then, like it, it's hard to develop that confidence and to be willing to stand your ground, especially in a non-medical model where you've now got to report to the same person uh, that, get, that gets tough. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I think that does get um, overlooked at the, the high school level, but youth sports is an industry now and you know there's so much promotion that goes into athletes and you know they're trying to build their brand essentially at such a young age mm -hmm. and make themselves noticed at such a young age and sports specialization is such a big thing now unfortunately and you know I think that you, we overlook how this has gotten to a point where there's always been parents who are like but my kid should be in and you know, that's always been a thing, 
but it's just been amplified with all of, all of that with social media with this kind of industrialization of it and you know when you have even high school coaches who have been there longer than the AT has been alive or you have uh, in in programs where this is like football's a really big deal and you know, there are a lot of places in the country where you know high school football is like there are 10,000 seat stadiums in some places and it's a big deal um, but even even in the smaller places right like parents can be um pushy we'll say <laughs> to put it nicely uh and that's you know that's tough it really it really does put those who are really trying to act in the best interest of the athlete in a tough position absolutely anything else that we haven't covered just kind of around you know the two of the situation and a lot of the other things that kind of come up around it that you wanted to touch on kind of before we fully wrap up yeah, I think just, you know, this is an example at the highest level, but how many kids are watching this and saying, well, Tua played through it, I can play too. And to me, that's something that's really concerning is, you know, they are meant to be or supposed to be the example. And when they are setting this kind of example, what ripple effect does that have? So we really need to be educating uh, our coaches and our, our athletes and our parents at younger levels we know that education doesn't necessarily mean attitude or behavioral change, but just continually reinforcing that these injuries need to be taken seriously. Like I said, second impact syndrome is a greater concern at younger ages, but there are you know, significant consequences that can come from repetitive, uh, re repeated concussions in a short amount of time. And then you add in the developing brain as a piece of it. Right. You know, how does that disrupt brain development in somebody who's younger as well? Um, or interact with brain development, you know, that's a whole nother thing. So just, we just need to be conservative, especially those listening who are working with, you know, younger athletes, like it's, it's just so important. We have to act in their best interest and really manage these conservatively, despite the pressures, even though it's easier said than done. Absolutely. Well, to wrap things up, if people wanted to connect with you, follow you anything you know around concussion what would be the best place for them to do that yeah uh you can follow me on twitter and instagram and facebook at julie stam phd you can check out my website which will be updated soon uh at <laughs> uh, juliestam.com um yeah you can find me there awesome and we will link all of that up so people can find that on the episode page I uh, appreciate you taking the time. Uh, really appreciate your expertise uh, when it comes to this and just kind of bringing it all back, reestablishing us that baseline of everything and having the conversation. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. And I just want to also mention, you can find uh, my book, The Brain on You Sports on Amazon or any other um, online retailer too, if that's uh, something you're interested in. And I really appreciate you having me on here to talk about this. Absolutely. Thanks again. Thank you all for listening to this episode of Athletic Training Chat. We hope you found it informative, just kind of reestablishing some of the things around concussions that athletic trainers deal with on a regular basis and the importance on being on the side of being conservative to look out for patients' long-term health. Really appreciate you taking the time. Please be sure to check out Dr. Stam's book. Um, it's a great one and helps support somebody within the profession doing really good work. Again, powered by Mueller Sports Medicine. We appreciate everything they do for us specifically at the podcast, but also the profession. Check out their new revived pneumatic compression priced at something that's affordable for many athletic training budgets and also, as always, backed by science. And again, we'll have a lot more information coming on that um, and hopefully an interview with them here in the near future. But with that, thank you again for listening. We appreciate everybody doing that. If you want to be on the show, please let us know. We'd be happy to talk to you and share your story when it comes to athletic training. Thanks again.